Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Dr. Matt Kaufman is the director of the Wyoming Migration Initiative. His research focus follows mule deer migration in Wyoming and has led to the discovery of the world's longest mule deer migration route from the Red Desert to the Hoback as the animals move from valleys to the mountains. They're looking to find that best spring salad mix. Dr. Matt Kaufman and the Wyoming Migration Initiative, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Support for Wyoming PBS is provided by the Matthew and Virgie O. Dragicevich Wyoming Foundation Trust, honoring the rich history and heritage of Wyoming. And as we begin this special Wyoming Chronicle, we want to remind our viewers that Nature's America Spring Live will debut beginning Monday, April 29th, Monday through Wednesday, beginning at 7 p.m. on Wyoming PBS. And we'll talk about the great rebirth of spring, not only across the country, but also here in Wyoming. And that leads us to our discussion today with Dr. Matt Kaufman, lead scientist at the Wyoming Migration Initiative and associate professor here at the University of Wyoming. Dr. Kaufman, welcome. Thanks for having me. You bet, it's our pleasure. Let's start with what is the Wyoming Migration Initiative, and then we'll get on to a little more of your research about mule deer and how they actually extend spring in Wyoming. Sure, you bet. Um, the Wyoming Migration Initiative is kind of a, an umbrella organization or, or an in initiative that we started at the University of Wyoming in 2012. And I'm a wildlife researcher and we had, our group had been doing a lot of work uh, on Wyoming's migrations of, of the ungulate species, mule deer and elk and pronghorn. And we recognized that while we were sort of discovering new things about these migrations, uh, at the same time, there was a lot of interest in conserving the migrations and a lot of interest in just understanding the migrations from the public. And we recognized that our work and the work of others around the migrations wasn't really getting into the hands of the people who could use it to, for example, you know, identify better places to put in road crossings or modify fences to make them more, more wildlife friendly. Um, I think we've sort of learned that these corridors need a bit of management and, and attention and the science wasn't really getting, there were people interested in doing that work, but the science wasn't getting there. So um, the Wyoming Migration Initiative, we primarily do research, but then what we do that's new is that we take that research and we try to translate it into tools and products that, that people can use, conservationists, wildlife managers, land managers can use to make better decisions about our corridors. And give me an example of how some of those, those tools have evolved. There's a Wyoming Atlas. There's mm -hmm. tools on a website. Tell me what's available. Yeah, so I think the, I mean, the, the primary tool is probably the corridors themselves. Um, these days, most of our work is done with collaring, right? So we capture these animals, we put a GPS collar on them, and the technology has really improved to the point where we can put a collar on the an animal and then let it go, and for two or three years, that collar is recording its location every one or two hours. And so then when we get that data back, we have this beautiful path of where the animal, you know, the migration it made in the spring, and then the migration back in the fall, and then again the next year. And one of the things that those, that, that data shows us is that these animals have really high fidelity. They're really habitual. They do the same thing year after year. So even a 150 mile migration, um, you see them doing that same path, almost following their same footsteps in the next year. So once you've mapped it, you know that you know that's that's the path, that's the place that we need to um, that we need to get mapped, and we need to manage, and that we need to keep open. And so, a lot of the early work was just figuring out how do we map that corridor, right? How do we go from um, the sort of spaghetti lines of every different animal going where they go to something that is um, synthesized for for and, and represents a corridor that the entire herd uses. And so that's that's sort of the main tool is mapping the corridors. And then that becomes literally, you know, a, a, a polygon that you can share with someone in the Wyoming Game and Fish Department or at the F Forest Service or in BLM. And they can put it on their maps. And now everybody's, you know, literally- Highway department, I mean, literally almost an endless amount of uses. Yeah, exactly. The old technology, 
you would have had the radio collar maybe on an animal. You would have learned maybe its position every, what, one or two weeks? And that would have been just for that specific moment in time? Is that is that what used to be? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's actually, I mean, Wyoming has this rich history of, of migration research. Um, starting actually back before um, the radio collars that you were just mentioning, they used to put neck bands on animals. And so like the early researchers in the 50s, um, the Craigheads working on elk in Yellowstone, they would catch a bunch of elk and put colored neck bands on them. And then that's all they are is just the color. So you have to reobserve the animal. So you'd have your binoculars yeah. maybe and hope to see. Yeah, so they would collar them like on winter range around Cody, Wyoming. And then they would, they would, then they would go up and traipse around in Yellowstone during the summer, hoping to find, you know, to reobserve the same animal. And then, you know, you know, two points. Right. They were, went, they were collared here in winter and we found them here in summer. And so you can just connect that line between those. And that's all you know. And then with radio collars, and now you have that produces a radio frequency, which you can hone into with an antenna. So now that created the possibility of locating the animal, but you have to go out and hear the sig listen with a directional antenna to get the signal. And yeah, you'd, so you get, you might have every two weeks, you'd know you'd get one location on the animal. <clears throat> What's surprising, I think, in looking at some of your research is how much has been discovered just in the last few years, mm -hmm. even though ranchers and others have been in Wyoming forever. Right, yeah, and it, and it is, discovery is, um, it, we, we have to sort of parse that a little bit, right? Because um, a, lot of the, a lot of the wildlife managers knew about migrations. They, they've known about them you know, for decades, right? I mean, like the animals disappear in the spring and head up to the mountains, right? And then they show up again in the fall. And so, uh, and, and some of those early managers, like there's a, there's a data set, a, a map from, from Wyoming Game and Fish in the Jackson region where they've literally, they used to go out and rake the snow every, every day. To look for tracks? And then the next day go look for tracks <laughs> and, you know, and, and record those mm -hmm. tracks on, you know, during the migration, record mm -hmm. those tracks on a map. And uh, a colleague of mine with the Game and Fish showed me a map of, of all of those, you know, all that data, right? Hard fought mm -hmm. data. So they, they knew, you know, they knew roughly where the animals were moving and roughly when it was happening. But I think the thing that we're discovering now is really has to do with the detail with which, you know, now, now we know their exact path and now we can map that exact path, you know, with, with considerable precision. And for management, that's really important because now we have a tool that we, that is dependable, right? Whereas it was really hard to manage a corridor if all you have is observations. Your research has yielded that this is a learned process. It's not a genetically inbred process. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. That was um, a study we published just last year. And um, we've kind of had that mm -hmm. inkling for a while that, um, that mammals have to learn these types of movements. And, and that's different from birds. With birds, they've, birds it is genetic. You can, you can take birds out of, out of the field uh, take the, the eggs out of the field, grow them up in a common garden or a common environment. And when it's time to migrate, they'll migrate at the correct time and in the correct direction, you know, that their mother would, right? Even though there's been no teaching from their mother. So it's, it's you know, it's genetically mm -hmm. coded. Mm -hmm. But with mammals, it has to be learned. <clears throat> and, um, and it wasn't quite known how that worked with, um, you know, with ungulates. And, um, and we did a study with translocated bighorn sheep and, and moose, and sure enough found that moose that had been, uh, moose and bighorn sheep that were just translocated, even when they come from a, a habitat where they were migratory, they wouldn't migrate in the new habitat. And because they didn't have the cultural knowledge of mm -hmm. how to do it. Mm -hmm. But then this was a really remarkable data set and we could look across time and see that over decades, they would, they would learn to migrate and they would learn to follow the plant green up better. Um, so it is, so they're capable of learning, but, it, but the cautionary tale there is it takes a long time. Like moose, it takes almost 80 years, close, close to a century for them to fully learn how to, how to migrate on the Wyoming landscape and you know, fully exploit the, the green forage and escape snow and, and do all that, you know, sort of orchestrate that perfectly. So it takes, it takes time, yeah. What I wonder about is that um, everywhere land uses change. Mm -hmm. And do we know enough 
of how those migration routes then are impacted? Um, or is this research all to understand how to protect the migration co um, corridors? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I mean, that's been a very active area of research for our group, um, trying to understand, uh, you know, the West, I mean, Wyoming's changing, the West is changing, right? And, you know, all this new data shows us how these animals move across the landscape. And now, um, as we get, you know, more roads or more traffic on the roads and more fences, um, you know, rural sprawl, oil and gas development, I mean, we kind of, the picture that emerges is that all of those changes to the landscape makes the migrations more difficult, right? Um, because they're always responding to that human disturbance, a road, a, a vehicle goes by or- Something that and, wasn't there a year ago is there today and what do we do? Right, exactly. So, um, <clears throat> and, the, and, and we certainly know, uh, we've, we, our, our group has published several studies that, that show that there is, there is an impact there, the animals, respond to that type of development. Um, sometimes they, they speed up and go faster. Sometimes they don't um, stop over and feed as much when they're in disturbed areas, especially with energy development. Um, but we also know that, that they do, for the most part, and this is with mule deer, they do continue to, to make it through. And so the question that, that is still sort of unanswered is, you know, how much change can you have on those landscapes and have the animals still, you know, make a viable migration, uh, a migration that's going to keep, you know, allowing them to put on as much fat as they need in the summer and to raise their young and everything, you know, still make a living. And that's kind of the, um, really the silver bullet that we've been working And, and we t we've talked off camera about tipping point. And are you confident because of your research that quarters can be preserved? Or are you worried that we might learn too late that a quarter corridor has been interrupted? Well, I, yeah, so kind of asked two different questions there. I mean, I, I, am, um, I am confident that corridors can be conserved, right? This is, this is kind of, um, in a lot of ways, like a, um, a real success of science-based wildlife management, right? Like, we know how to do this, right? We know how to map the corridors. Um, the animals use the same corridors year in and year out, so so once you figure out where that corridor is, you know, that's the place to invest our energy in and that's the place to keep open, right? That's the path. Um, so we know how to do that. And we also know how to keep those corridors open, right? So in Wyoming, we've had several highway crossing projects that allow um, animals to get over the highway or go under them. Um, we know how to modify fences to make them more wildlife friendly. Um, there are land trusts in the state who are conserving big ranches. A lot of these corridors move across big private ranches. Um, we know how to prevent development on those. We even, when it comes to oil and gas development, we know uh, the companies do this all the time, directionally drill. So we can directionally drill of, around corridors and still access all of, all of the, oil, the gas mm -hmm. that's underneath them without you know, disturbing the surface. So like, we know how to do this. We have all the pieces in place to do this. Um, so, so I'm confident that, that conserving corridors is absolutely doable. And Wyoming is sort of leading the West in, in, in doing it. Um, what I'm not confident about is you know, whether we will figure out, whether we will get all the pieces in place that we need to have to do the conservation before it's too late for some corridors that are seeing, you know, sort of rapid changes on the landscapes that those corridors cross. How has your initiative been received by others in the, primarily in the West? Uh, very, very positively. Um, we've, we, there's other Western states that, um, most Western states have migrate, you know, their big game herds migrate just like ours do. And for one reason or another, we've been a little bit ahead um, of mapping corridors, but other Western states have been picking up some of the tools, like, like the tools we've developed to actually map the corridors and um, other tools about uh, identifying threats along the, and in, in, in road crossings and fence uh, modifications, things like that. So other states have been sort of watching what Wyoming has been doing. And even, um, you know, some have started their own migration initiatives, like Utah a couple of years ago 
started its own Utah migration initiative um, modeled after the Wyoming migration initiative. Who supports the Wyoming migration initiative? The migration initiative is uh, primary, primarily funded through foundations. Um, so a lot of our research is funded through traditional means, uh, partnering with the State Wildlife Agency, um, the U.S. Geological Survey, um, a lot of sportsman groups like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Muley Fanatics. A lot of those groups help the, fund the collaring studies, but there's several private foundations that have really sort of stepped up um, and, and bought into this idea of you know, translating the science and helping the public learn more about the migrations. What do we know about how <clears throat> other events impact migration corridors? Climate change, predators, other unforeseen wildlife management decisions. What have we learned in the last few years? Well, that's kind of a big question. Um, I think so. We, we do, we do, we get sort of aspects of this question a, a fair bit, and and. Um, and like, for example, with predators, right? You know, like um, often people are curious, like, well, if there's a wolf pack that sure. sets up there, does that alter the migration? And, and with climate change, the same thing. You know, these animals that, uh, when plants green up is really important to a mule deer, which is always trying to find the fresh uh, green grass. And I think what we, what we have seen is that, um, the migrations are so important, like that actual path is so important that the way I think about it is that that's the template for the animal's annual movement, right? So they're gonna follow that path in the spring and then they're gonna follow it back in the fall. And there aren't that many things that will um, really alter that movement. So if they, hit a, if they run into predators, you know, they'll stop, maybe they'll stop and wait for a day until the predators pass, but then continue on rather than deviate. Or like with climate change, you know, climate change is making green up come faster. So they, they, they're not gonna abandon that migration corridor. They'll still use it. They'll just shift their timing of how they move it. And in fact, you know, I like to think of migration as sort of being a great adaptation to climate change because if you, if you have, you know, a spring green up in the plains or the sagebrush basins, and you have access to one that's up in the mountains, you have this huge gradient that you can exploit as climate change is sort of reshuffling things, as opposed to a resident animal that just lives in one place year round. I wanna talk about <clears throat> your research with mule deer, so yep. how they're able to extend spring mm -hmm. by essentially doing what you were just referring to, um, looking for that, you've called it the spring salad mix yep. that allows them to get fatter. Right. Um, how did you come upon that um, research and why does it interest you and what have you learned? Yeah, so that's, that's been um, a really sort of a, a exciting development in our group. Um, and this work started with um, uh, work that a colleague of mine, Hall Sawyer, was doing for his PhD. And what Hall recognized is, this was with mule deer migrations, he recognized that, you know, in a, in a three week long migration, the animals weren't just, it, it doesn't take them three weeks long to get up into the mountains. You know, they could do it in a couple of days, but the points were piling up in these stopover areas. And Hall started to think, well, you know, why are they, why are they stopping over? And the idea that we came up with was that, well, maybe they're stopping over to sort of stay in pace with the green up, right? And, and what I mean by that is that for it's this, this is the spring salad mix idea that you just referenced is that when, when plants are first greening up, that's when they're most nutritious for an animal like a mule deer. Uh, they're really easy to digest, they're high in protein, and they can convert that to fat, right? When plants are like, you know, this high, then they're really fibrous, they're hard to digest, and animals can't put on much fat eating that type of food. So they seek out that fresh green grass. And that, and Hall had the idea that maybe what we were seeing it was all that stopping over was the animals staying in pace. And so at that time, Hall and I did kind of a clunky analysis that suggested that that was going on. And then just recently, a, a different PhD student of mine, Ellen Aikens, um, figured out how to you know, couple the, the GPS movements with remote sensing measures of when each 
pixel on the landscape was greening up. And she showed really conclusively, this is in mule deer that migrate up the Wyoming range in the western part of the state, that those animals are literally mm. choreographing their movements with the spring green up. And this is like a two month long migration. And many of the, the mule deer in that data set were literally surf, we call this surfing, and they're literally surfing perfectly. Who knew meaning, that mule deer surfed? Right. Yeah. And, and what we mean by that is that they're, like if you were to um, chart the movements of what we would call a perfect surfer, always being in the right place at the right time, nearly a third of the animals were doing that, surfing perfectly over a two month period. And that means, you know, they're always in a patch that's just greening up and they're getting the best food. And, and we refer the, to that also as extending spring, right? Instead of being a resident animal, spring comes, there's good food for a little while and then it just passes you by and then you're just getting what, what you can get, right? And the, and the forage quality is just declining as sort of this wave passes you by. But if you migrate, then as the wave comes, you just follow with it. And so it's, it's peak spring the whole time for two months while you're migrating up in the mountains. And, and that turns out to be really important for these animals. They've just come off winter where they were starving all winter, burning the fat reserves from last year. And now they, now they need to replenish those reserves and build up their fat. And, and surfing the green wave is, is one of the ways that they do that. You referenced earlier about the migration path from the, whole, uh, from the Red Desert to the Hoback mm -hmm. and then back. You, you're, you and your team discovered that, the longest migration path for mule deer in the world. How did you come upon that? Was that through this research that you um, learned that how the length of 150 miles or more with mm -hmm. uh, their migration runs? Yeah, that's, that's a great story. And so, and the discovery is attributed to my colleague, Hall Sawyer, who I mentioned <clears throat> earlier. Hall was doing some work in the Red Desert, funded by the BLM. And the goal was to sort of understand the year round habits of what they thought was a resident mule deer herd, you know, living year round in the desert. And, and the story is better when Hall tells it, but he, you know, when he went to retrieve the collars, um, he couldn't find them, right? He went back to the Red Desert to listen for the collars and they weren't there. And so he had to, you know, eventually rent a, um, a fixed wing airplane to fly up of where they could be and, you know, and found them 150 miles away. And, and so that's how that was, that um, corridor was discovered. Um, and then, and then since then there's, there's been, we've had an additional discovery. We've been continuing to monitor that herd because it's really been kind of a flagship, flagship migration. And um, in 2016, we called it an animal that broke that record by 90 miles and went uh, all the way up to the upper Hoback where those animals summer. But then she went over the Grovance down into Jackson Hole and then around Jackson Lake and up over the Tetons and she summers in Island Park, Idaho. Dr. Kaufman, I assume there's a lot more to learn. So I'm curious as to what are you working on now and what, what's down the road? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, we're, so we're working on uh, a number of different things right now. Um, one of the, well, we have several different projects trying to understand you know, this question about how much um, how much development these animals can withstand, these migrations can withstand. And um, it turns out that's a really hard question to get at. Um, we've just started some collaborations with other states around the West, so uh, Idaho in particular, and um, that, and, and, and Utah. And so that allows us to sort of, um, ha you know, just have a larger data set looking across landscapes that are really pristine and those that are highly developed and starting to tease out, you know, where do you still have migrations and where do we see that the migrations are impaired? So that's a, that's a big question. Um, and, and obviously that's one that's really important for how we manage um, these herds. Um, we have other projects that are looking at, um, we're kind of continuing on, uh, this is actually a project with an undergrad where we're kind of continuing on some of this learning stuff and um, trying to understand, uh, so there's wildlife friendly fencing uh, that's common in the West. Lots of groups fund that work. That's all mostly based on the adults. And so 
we now, along some of these migration corridors, have trail cameras up where we can observe the behavior of the adults and their fawns and the group that they're in. And so we're starting to ask, you know, well, how does the fawn, um, like on that 150 mile migration, as they come out of the mountains, the first fence that fawn sees is the first fence it's ever encountered. And then we know on that migration, it encounters about a hundred different fences mm. on its way to winter range. So, you know, is it better at the end of that 150 mile migration and the hundredth fence, is it better at navigating those fences um, than it was when it encountered the first one? And also like, does mom play a role? Does mom, does mom know could, that it has to? In my to, mind, I just yeah. see mom lifting the fence right, up. Right. And I'm sure it's right. not that. Well, that's, we have, we now have these uh, trail camera videos right on the fence points. We're gonna be installing more. And, and so that's one of the things we're, we're, we're curious too, is like, does a mom with a you know, young fawn do anything differently when she encounters a fence versus a mom that doesn't have a fawn? How does that and, teaching component really work out in nature? Right. And, then we, and then of course, we'll also be asking, are there some fences that are just easier to navigate and learn how to navigate than others? Mm -hmm. And kind of wanting to sort of drill down into um, you know, how we have to have fences in, in Wyoming, we're a, we're a ag state, and, um, but some of those fences are easier for animals, for these, um, you know, the native ungulates to move through than others. The Migration initiative doesn't work on an island. You have many partners. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, you know, most of, uh, our most important partner is, uh, is the state, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, you know, all of our collaring studies, you know, and the collaring work is the sort of uh, the foundation of, of mapping these migration corridors and studying migration. And all that work is done in collaboration with the state uh, wildlife biologists and game warden. You know, we also partner with um, the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, um, the Forest Service, uh, these, uh, the National Park Service, Yellow Yellowstone and Grand Teton. And that's one of the things you, you, sort of, you sort of have to do that when you study sure. migration because, because these migrations <clears throat> connect all these different land ownership uh, types, which are, which are all managed by different groups. Um, and then the other one to mention is that there's, there's a lot of sportsman groups that um, are really tuned into these migrations and they sort of recognize that maintaining migrations is an important part about sustaining the productivity of big game herds. And a lot of those groups like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and Muley Fanatic Foundation, Wild Sheep Foundation and others raise money to help fund the research and discovery and mapping of these migration corridors as well. Dr. Matt Kaufman, throughout the show, we've listed resources that people can go to to find more information, but the simple place is just to go to the Wyoming Migration Initiative and start there and look at the resources that are available. Yep, absolutely, migrationinitiative.org. Fascinating work. Thank you so much for joining us today on Wyoming Chronicle. You bet, thanks for having me. Support for Wyoming PBS is provided by the Matthew and Virgie O. Dragicevich Wyoming Foundation Trust, honoring the rich history and heritage of Wyoming.